When it comes to choices with layered, morally ambiguous, and sometimes unexpected outcomes, few game studios write these better than CD Projekt Red, and Cyberpunk 2077 certainly isn't short of challenging and difficult decisions. So in this video, we're looking at five of the biggest ones that we'll face throughout the game. Bear in mind, there's tons more in addition to this, so just because I don't mention a certain one here doesn't mean it isn't also tough. Huge thanks to my Patreon supporters as always, and now, let's get to it. One of the most branching and far-reaching set of choices you can make in this game comes right at the beginning during the quest The Pickup. Here, we're sent to acquire a Militech bot from Maelstrom, which plays a crucial role in the heist. There's three main ways this can play out, alongside other smaller variations, and the main differences to the rest of the game lie in which iconic weapons we can get. If Royce dies in any way during this quest, we can loot the iconic Chaos Tech Pistol, which cycles between elemental damage effects on every reload. Equally, if Dum Dum survives this quest, we eventually can loot the iconic Doom Doom revolver from him much later on in the game. This is a direct reference to the Doom franchise and as you can imagine, inflicts an intense amount of extra gore. However, if we side with Militech's Meredith Stout, we can instead get the iconic joke weapon dildo bat Sir John Falastiff. It's a super annoying choice for anyone wanting to collect all the iconic weapons, literally making it impossible in one playthrough. You'll have to think long and hard, like Sir John Falastiff, about what type of build you want to be for your playthrough and then assess which selection of weapons will be best for you. Equally, you may wish to use none of these, in which case the choice purely comes down to how you want the story to play out. And again, there's no definitively outright good or bad ending. It's tough. Meeting with Meredith, then paying for the bot with the spiked Militech cred chip, or otherwise outright attacking Maelstrom, will allow us to loot Chaos. However, this is without a doubt the toughest way to resolve this mission, since V and Jackie have to take on the entire Maelstrom base by their lonesome. But if you escape successfully, then later on we'll get a Meredith romance scene as well as Sir John Falastiff, which despite being a joke weapon, is one of the most powerful blunt ones in the game as I discovered in this video. However, Dum Dum obviously won't show up at Tota Tant's later on account of him being dead, so there's no way to ever get Doom Doom. It'll instead be Brick there if we freed him during the pickup, or if all three of these guys died it'll be Patricia. Either way, neither have Doom Doom. Equally, meeting with Meredith but removing the virus from the Militech cred chip and telling Maelstrom this will result in Militech's storming all foods and us fighting our way out against Militech alongside Maelstrom. Meredith will die in this scenario, will never get Sir John, but will have the option to kill or incapacitate Dum Dum later at Totentance to get Doom Doom. Also, despite technically siding with Royce in this scenario, it's still possible to get Chaos. What we have to do is wait until we get to the main entrance, where Royce is fighting Militech, then simply wait and allow him to get killed. There is a chance he survives this scenario though, so be ready to reload a save if he fights particularly particularly well. After this, loot Chaos from his body, and we'll still have two out of the three Iconics. But sadly, no romance encounter, which is upsetting for a whole different set of reasons. Finally, there is a third option to all of this, and whilst it only results in one Iconic, it is also the only way to acquire a legendary Satara shotgun, and maybe in the interest of some shotty berserk tank types. Mind you, it's without a doubt the most long-winded approach to this gig, and relies on several things. Firstly, do not meet with Stouts before entering all foods. This is the only way to not get tailed by Militech and not have them assault the base when the deal goes well. Second, you'll have to rack up 10k eddies by yourself before entering all foods. It's perfectly possible to achieve this, there's 23 gigs littered around Watson which we can complete for money, but it's certainly more of a grind. With this done though, head to all foods, go through the encounter with Royce, and simply agree to pay out of your own pockets. We'll get the flathead and simply leave peacefully. No Militech, no combat, no chance to get chaos, free brick, or romance magic. Meredith. There's still the option to get Doom Doom later, but there's also a unique benefit exclusive to this method. With no assault ever having taken place, all foods continues to function as before, and thus even immediately after the pickup, we can re-enter and talk to this weapon vendor, the only one in the game to sell the legendary Satara, which is the only tech-based shotgun there is. So yeah, real tough on this, and obviously no real way of knowing the consequences of each choice without playing them out, some of which don't even come up until way later in the game. Personally, much as I enjoy Doom Doom though, I am partial to siding with Meredith, but hey, there's no definitively right or wrong answer here, save for maybe siding with Maelstrom and having Royce survive, because that way we only get Doom Doom. But even then, that's a whole nother unique encounter over at Totentance. Kinda makes you wish that CDPR had put this many independent variables into lots of other quests in the game, now that I think about it. 
Next up is the choice which crops up during the quest I Walk the Line, as to whether we side with Netwatch or the Voodoo Boys. Now, whilst this doesn't have as far extending consequences as the pickup, there are reasons on both sides for siding with one or the other. Now, we'll contact the Voodoo Boys a ways into Act 2 after learning that it was they who hired Evelyn Parker to steal this whole biochip in the first place. Our hope is that they can shed some light on what the hell to do about the Johnny Silverhand construct that's slowly overwriting our brain. That said, their leader, Maman Brigitte, isn't available when we make contact, so instead we'll meet with Placide, who Brigitte later describes as a basic animal. An animal who'll send us to take on the hordes of animal gang members at the gym in order to reach the Netwatch agent inside. All seems fairly above board. Do this thing for us and we'll help you. Fair's fair. Except when we meet the Netwatch agent and actually hear him out, we'll learn that no, that's not the case at all. This dude, Bryce Mosley, will explain that the Voodoo Boys see us as nothing more than a Ranyan, which translated to English means rack. He explains that Placide is merely using us to get this job done, and has in fact planted a virus into our system not only designed to fry Netwatch agents, but also us too. We are not supposed to survive this as far as the Voodoo Boys are concerned. In fact, this was pretty obvious from the start if we look back, with Placide attempting to forcefully jack us into their subnet, being very shady as to why, and explaining that we're being sent to do the job instead of the Voodoo Boys, because that's just how they operate. Yeah, in truth, it's because Placide sees us as disposable. He has no idea what the bio chip is or what we're worth, and we're just a merc to him. Or rather, a floor rack. The Netwatch agent even has us run multiple scans on our systems to provide evidence of the virus present. All in all, he seems like a pretty stand-up guy and is a lot more transparent than Placide. Maintaining loyalty to the Voodoo Boys then and incapacitating Bryce merely puts the virus into motion, and were it not for the relic, V would have easily been dead. This is clear by the surprise on Placide's face when we return to him still alive. He even has the audacity to demand how we survived, and basically straight up admitting that our death was in the plans all along. Fortunately, Brigitte intervenes, realising we're in possession of the biochip, and now she can use us to contact Alt Cunningham with Johnny's engram to grant the Voodoo Boys passage through the Black Wall. Brigitte is somewhat nicer than Placide, but again, the help she's willing to provide is purely to suit her own ends. All in all, the Voodoo Boys are arseholes, first using us like a floor rag, and then purely because of the biochip. It's no wonder then that V and Johnny are pretty satisfied when inadvertently causing this whole room of runners to get fried. Which brings us back to option two. Yes, the Netwatch agent is pretty transparent with us, except not really. You see, he does wipe the deadly virus, but also secretly replaces it with a tracker, allowing Netwatch to invade the Voodoo Boy subnet and get to Alt Cunningham once we locate her. This results in Alt moving us to another region of cyberspace and having to fry all the Voodoo Boys in the process. Look, I'm not sad to see them suffer this fate, after all, they've treated us with total disregard, and installing a secret tracker is nothing compared to a virus literally designed to kill us. But that doesn't make the Netwatch agent fully right. He did this knowing we'd be inside the lion's den right when Netwatch was going to aggro the lions. He again acts with blatant disregard for us, though at the same time doesn't go out of his way to directly cause us any harm. And if you really think about it, I don't think any Netwatch agent would pass up a golden opportunity like this at the expense of a total stranger. Corps get a bad rep in this world and not without good reason, but I'd argue that Netwatch actually has a pretty important role when it comes to defending the new nets from attacks beyond the black wall. Bryce likens it to keeping a torn open trash bag taped over a broken window. Without them, I don't doubt the world would be chaos at the hands of rogue AIs, but even still, on a personal level, the guy isn't entirely straight with us, and one way or the other, we are getting screwed here by somebody. Personally, I'd say the Netwatch agent is a far more decent guy far as this city goes, though siding with him does leave us no choice than to face a tough fight out of the subway tunnels and a boss battle with Placide. Mind you, doing this will allow us to loot the time-worn trench coats, which I'd argue is one of the best pieces of legendary clothing in the game and holds four mods. A third option I also like though is this. Stick with the Voodoo Boys, allow them to screw you over, go through the whole never fade away flashback, and then, when all's said and done, just don't leave peacefully. Yes, we do still get messed about by someone, but we then get to elect to take revenge on the Voodoo Boys on our terms. We still get the trench coat and whatever quick acts these guys have on them, and both Netwatch and the Voodoo Boys lose. It's tough though, because I actually actually quite like this agent dude, even though he screws us over a little bit. I'm sort of hoping that those who sided with him maybe get a little side quest where we meet him again in Phantom Liberty. But that's just a random false hope of mine, I have nothing concrete at all to back that up. Either way, a few options here, but no definitively 100% good or bad outcome. 
This one's less important to overall events, save for one of the potential outcomes here. But whether you stick with Judy or go with Maiko's plan during Pisces is a choice very much obscured by moral greyness. Judy's plan is to stage a revolution at Clouds where Evelyn worked, kick out the Tiger Claws, and transform the place into a great institution of the dolls, by the dolls, and for the dolls. Ideologically, it's a noble idea, cutting ties with tyrannical gangs and preventing abusive scumbags like Woodman from mistreating the dolls like he did Evelyn. On the other on the other hand, Judy's ex-girlfriend Maiko, who currently runs Clouds in all but name, has a less radical, but also less noble idea to place herself officially as leader of Clouds, whilst maintaining the security of the Tiger Claws, albeit less on site. To most Judy lovers out there, the obvious choice appears to be to side with her. After all, we want to stay in her good graces, continuing to pursue a romance with her. So in this instance, when Maiko makes her power play to the Tiger Claw bosses, we stop her, kill all three men in the room, and stick to Judy's plan of letting the dolls control clouds. Judy is immediately happy that things went as planned, though bear in mind there is the potential for Maiko to attack us here if we pick certain dialogue with her. Now, whilst we could definitely say that she acted in bad faith here, despite the potential good that might actually come from her actions, which we'll get to in a sec, I really don't think she deserves to die. And you can straight up avoid combat by simply picking the top option, can't know that for sure. Killing her will also upset Judy, who insists it's unnecessary. But you won't be locked out of of anything, she'll just be unhappy for a bit. Leave the building having followed Judy's plan and not killing Maiko and all is fine and dandy, at least for a while. You see, as ideologically noble as Judy's plan was, not long after the Tigers attack Clouds in revenge, and in fact Tom, a doll we meet a couple of times and is friends with Judy, is killed. She'll tell us all this just before the romance scene at Laguna Bend, and I imagine Tom's death will weigh heavily on her conscience now for the rest of her life. Tough as this decision is though, I kind of love it, because it plays into the whole fact of life that a seemingly good idea at the time will always have unforeseen consequences in both measures of good and bad further in the future. We can read two emails on Judy's computer after this, one from Roxanne, another doll explaining what happened to Tom, and the second from Maiko, if she lived through this, essentially rubbing it in Judy's face and saying I told you so. Except it's not like Maiko's plan is anything of a solution either. If we follow this series of events, let Maiko take over, then yes, Tom doesn't die, but we can then find emails from both Tom and Roxanne explaining how pretty much nothing has changed from before. Dolls are still treated like crap, only now it's coming from Maiko. Roxanne feels guilty for killing a bunch of people for not really much reason, but whilst the club does maintain ties with the Tigers, they're no longer constantly skulking around there. It's really tough to say here which decision is actually best. Yes, Tom dying is an immediate obvious negative, but whether things are ultimately better for the dolls in the the long term after that isn't entirely clear. Clouds gets closed indefinitely after the assault, but does appear possibly to have reopened by the end of the game, according to one email. Now, there is of course one objectively bad outcome we can wind up with going with Maiko if we accept payment from her as Cloud's new manager. Yes, 18k is a nice sum, but losing Judy as a romance option, or even just a friend, really isn't. We can still visit her apartment if we do this, but she'll refuse to speak to us and won't answer our calls. We don't get pyramids one of the best side jobs in the game, and overall, there's really no good reason to do this. However, so long as we do refuse her money, Judy will admit Maiko does know more than her about running clouds, will still get to romance, and whilst Judy will get upset at the unchanged situation, clouds will remain open and Tom won't die. No true happy ending with this one, but let me know in the comments the lesser of two evils here and why. Or you could just say evil is evil. Lesser, greater, middling. The degree is arbitrary, the definition's blurred, and if you have to choose between one evil and another, you'd rather not choose at all. Delamain is a full AI-powered taxi service which operates around Night City and whom we're first introduced to during the heist as our driver and eventual getaway driver. Personally, I think they absolutely nailed the design of a future AI personality here, with a certain degree of charm, but also an unwavering adherence to their own programmed rules. However, it seems not every part of the Delamain network is sticking to this cold, but also kind of warm and calm personality. Seven Delamain vehicles have departed from the network, with us tasked to track them down. In doing so, we get to know each of them a little bit, with each immediately giving off a totally different character archetype. One car is very depressed, another is extremely anxious, whilst one is a straight up GLaDOS ripoff from Portal. So much so that they even repeat the famous line about all the cake being gone. I'm going to kill you, and all the cake is gone. 
It's clear that each of these vehicles demonstrates a high degree of self-awareness, becoming essentially conscious as far as we can tell. Anywho, rounding them up and having them return to the Delamain HQ, the problem will be seemingly resolved. That is, until a bit later, when we find another malfunctioned Delamain vehicle in the big city centre roundabouts. This prompts our return to Delamain with the challenge of traversing the now highly electrified garage. Carefully making our way to the Delamain core, it's a set of three options, which to me are quite reminiscent of Mass Effect's endings. We can reset Delamain as he's asking, wiping his memory and snuffing out his rogue variants, or we can shoot the core, utterly destroying OG Delamain and letting his children, as it were, ultimately run free, but but equally, there's the synthesis option, if you have 10 intelligence, to merge Dell and his variants into one new, higher form of life, which seems very similar to what Alt's doing in the main story. But you know the drill by now, not a single one of these is definitively good or outright evil. Johnny seems very much more in favour of the Delamain variants than Delamain himself, though that of course does make perfect sense, as it's literally a reflection of the little guy rebelling against their powerful overlords. Whilst he brings valid points to the argument, I wouldn't say Johnny's opinion should serve as the only moral compass here. Now, there is a chance, and this is mentioned, that these rogue AI elements surface from the fact that there's a virus inside Delamain's system, causing certain subroutines to malfunction and appear to develop their own personalities. Now, whilst I do subscribe to the idea that there's certainly some form of digitized life at this point, even if the virus was their origin, it's actually pretty tough to argue with 100% certainty that these guys truly are alive as it were. Also, resetting the core still comes with plenty of benefits. Arguably, the largest amount of post-mission content is unlocked by resetting Delamain. We'll receive a cab with the OG Delamain personality, only no memory of what came before. Each day as we drive, we'll be able to have new conversations on philosophy, meaning, and lots more. He'll even make a comment or two about Skippy if we drive with him equipped. So yeah, in terms of more Delamain content, I'd say this is the best choice, but that doesn't mean it's the right one. Destroying the core will strike straight up kill Delamain. The same AI who saved our life during the heist, though also didn't drive Jackie to a Ripperdock because our package wasn't programmed that way. There's also an interesting email thread we can read as we enter the building to learn all about how Dell slowly laid off the human workers in every department of the company until it was just him. That, in some ways, speaks to the growing role of AI in our society now. But at the end of the day, if Delamain has no need for human workers, then what really is the point of forcing people to work empty meaningless jobs. In its immediacy, it's an unfortunate result of changing times, but doesn't make the guy a tyrant. He's well-mannered, and seems to believe that these hiccups in his code really are nothing more than a virus. In fact, if we do this, Dell's last act in the split moment before his core is obliterated is still to make sure that we, as a member of the Excelsior package, are still cared for. The Excelsior AI, in this case, is canonically designed to ensure we maintain all the benefits of that package. Look, as far as AIs go, Dell is one of the better ones, and Defo doesn't deserve to straight up die. That said, nor do his kids, and freeing them in this case will actually receive texts sometime after to learn that this lot have actually gone on to pursue lives, kind of. Venturing into space, finding the meaning of life, and more. It's again extra Delamain content, though not as much as the previous option. So then finally, we're left with synthesis, to use the Mass Effect term. All Delamain personalities merge together and become a nigh-on unrecognized recognizable new thing unshackled from the life of a cab driver. Kinda reminds me of Dr. Manhattan, or no, the Augur of Dunlane from the College of Winterhold. Yeah, that's a good comparison. Wherever this new version of Dell ends up, we're left with Delamain Jr., who functions pretty similar to Excelsior. We get the same basic interactions, but no funny car texts. It's the least amount of post-mission content this one, but nobody has to definitively die. Overall, this one's so damn difficult due to both the post-content and morality-based reasoning within each option. Synthesis might morally be best, though who's to say this doesn't in fact practically kill all the Delamain personalities in order to create something new. At the same time, the other two do mean straight up wiping out one party, so that isn't really much better. Ultimately, the choice is down to your own interpretation as to the nature of these cars' apparent sentience, as well as whether you value more conversations with Delamain when driving around Night City.
Final choice then of these five is the one that you all voted for as the overall toughest. So long as you don't pick the side with Hanako option of the four main endings, you'll ultimately wind up, one way or another, having to make a big final choice. I'm gonna be honest, when I was first faced with the choice to keep V's body or give it to Johnny, I was conflicted, but I imagine most of you ultimately decided to have V take the body at first. Sure, we'll probably live for far less time, but V is the protagonist of this story, and personally, I just wanted to see how that story ultimately ended. It's the plan we'd spent the last two thirds of the game setting up for after all. That said, it certainly doesn't make this one an easy decision, and selfish narrative curiosity aside, there's also moral and logical things to consider as well. I don't know about you, but going through so very much in an attempt to save V's life only to be told at the very last hurdle that it has all been in vain hits like a freaking Thornton Mackinac truck. It's an emotional moment for multiple reasons, and V's performance at being utterly shattered by by this revelation sells it really well. No, no, no way. That was not our deal. We can have V return to their body, but on the understanding that they'll likely still die after about six months or so. Alternatively, since the body has naturally been reassimilated to house the mind of Johnny Silverhand, his engram can inhabit it permanently. He'd actually get a chance at a full life, whereas we'd probably die anyway. Whoever doesn't keep the body also doesn't necessarily die. Instead, traveling beyond the black wall, having become an engrammatic AI. Whether or not assimilating with Orc Cunningham though means just another form of death in a sense is pretty tough to determine, as we don't really know the nature as to how an AI who absorbs other AIs really exists as a conscious sentient being. But at a basic level, you could say giving the body to Johnny does mean both get to live on a lot longer in some form, though we couldn't really say what it looks like for V in this case. At the same time, coming to this point via an ending like the Alder Caldos especially robs all of V's friends from ever seeing them again. And I'm gonna be honest, leaving Night City with Pan Am and Judy, even if it only lasts for six months, is so obvious obviously better than receiving this worried and heartbroken phone call from Judy if we surrender our body to Johnny. Fuck. V, I, I don't know where we went wrong. Maybe uh, something happened or you needed to lay low. If you can, just give me s some kind of signal that, that you're alive and everything's okay. Please. If you ever need help, you know. I'm here for you, right? Always. <sighs> Stay safe. Call me when you hear this. Bear in mind, leaving with Judy will see her way more happy than she's ever been at any other point. Hell, even if you're a male V or just leave with Pan Am on a platonic level, things seem to end on a pretty hopeful note, even if I can't see how V would actually feasibly find a way to survive after this. Equally, the Crystal Palace ending gives some hint that Mr. Blue Eyes might actually have the power to save V somehow, so all isn't necessarily lost on that front either. Stronger case for V. Equally, by going through the rogue ending as Johnny, it's ultimately him who's in control of who gets V's body. And we can here, in one of the darkest turns of the game, pick options where Johnny forcibly steals V's body, telling them they have absolutely no choice in the matter and there's literally nothing they can do. Know what? I couldn't give a pig's prick what you think. I stay, you fuck off, that's the deal. And okay, I'd say this is an objectively pretty bad one. Sure, Johnny has a logical reason to do this, but I think having the power to take V's body and actually going through with it definitely tends right towards the douchebag side of Johnny Silverhand. Do whatever it takes to stop him, defeat him, gut him. If I gotta kill, I'll kill. If I need your body, I'll fucking... <laughs> And V, surrendering their body to Johnny after several Outer Caldos have given their lives to save them, again, doesn't quite sit right with me. So I think the best scenario in which the arguments to give Johnny the body are heaviest come in the Don't Fear the Reaper ending. With nobody having given their life to grant V this opportunity, and V being in control, we can choose whichever of the two with far less of a guilty conscience. Also, in this case, Johnny and V are both completely present for the assault on Arasaka Tower, a thing that no doubt solidifies the bond between the two even further and makes it so 
so that this can go either of the two ways, with neither being much more of a tragedy than the other. In this scenario especially, V did pull off the impossible, and earned the right to choose, completely free of having to uphold any obligations to others. There's a way deeper conversation to be had here, in breaking down the good and bad sides of each main ending, and I'll explore that further in another video. For now though, all this is to say that who should get V's body is not as cut and dry as it may first appear, and there absolutely are arguments for both to receive it. Though from a gameplay perspective, there are more endings overall to experience in giving V the body, as opposed to the same one that we get when giving it to Johnny in all three scenarios. Overall though, this game is utterly chock full of tough, morally grey decisions, and I have a very long list of extra entries that didn't quite make my top 5, but I'm sure I'll get around to breaking more of them down in future videos if I haven't done so in another one already. For example, I already went over the Perales choice in my side jobs video, so if you want to take on that one, that's where you can find it. Otherwise, comment below the choices you think are best regarding these 5 quests, as well as which other choices you found really tough to decide. Again, massive thanks to my patrons for helping to provide me with the breathing room to make longer, more introspective videos like this. You can donate from as little as a pound a month for early access to content, your name in each video, as well as sometimes voting on topics. Thank you again for watching today, I'm Sam Brown, and I'll see you soon in another video.